Hi friends, welcome to the New York State Museum. My name is Kat Morehouse and I'm a museum instructor here. And today we are back in our open spaces exhibit at the museum to talk about aquatic animals, their habitats, and their adaptations. If you have any questions or comments, just use the box below to let us know. Did you guys know that most of our planet is covered in water? In fact, 71% of our planet is covered in water. So that includes freshwater habitats like lakes, ponds, and streams. It includes saltwater habitats like the Atlantic Ocean and brackish water habitats like estuaries, uh, salt marshes, tidal bays, and parts of the Hudson River. And brackish water is where freshwater and saltwater meet and mix. And in all of these different aquatic habitats, we find animals of all shapes and sizes. There are birds, fish, mammals, mollusks, insects, and more. So we're gonna go ahead and check some out. In our freshwater habitats, we have birds. So we find birds like the common loon, which is designed for hunting fish. They can dive deep down and catch fish with their spear-shaped beaks. We find birds like our mallard duck, which is a filter feeder. They eat aquatic plants and insects. We find mammals like our North American beaver, designed to spend a lot of its time in the water with its transparent eyelids, webbed feet, and paddle tail. We have reptiles in our freshwater habitats like the painted turtle that eats a lot of aquatic plants and insects and mollusks like our freshwater mussels. So we have native mollusks like the elliptio and they feed on algae. Unfortunately, in a lot of our freshwater environments, we also can find invasive species of mussels like the zebra mussel which will attach itself to flat surfaces and filter feeds algae at such a high rate that it actually can destroy ecosystems. So we wanna be really careful about what we're introducing into our freshwater habitats. In our saltwater habitats, we find reptiles like our leatherback sea turtles in places like the Atlantic Ocean. We find fish like the mako shark we can find mollusks like the bay scallops that also filter feed on algae. Our gray seal, which can get really, really big, over 500 pounds, feeds on fish and squid. Our harbor porpoise, which is another mammal along with the gray seal. We find birds like the laughing gull. And the laughing gull is a really opportunistic eater. So they're going to eat things like insects, worms, snails, crabs. They're also going to eat things like berries and even garbage if we make it available. So we have to be sure that we are keeping our beaches clean so that they're not eating anything that they shouldn't be. We also find a variety of species of animals in our estuaries. So again, the estuaries are those brackish water environments like the salt marshes, tidal bays, and parts of the Hudson River. And we find mammals like the harbor seal. They can also get pretty big, uh, up to 250 pounds, and they feed on fish and crustaceans. Other mammals that we find in estuaries are our river otters eating fish and crustaceans, also designed to be in the water with their webbed feet. And this cute little guy over here, which is our muskrat. Muskrats kind of look like baby beavers, but they have a much thinner tail. They only get to be about five pounds and they eat mostly aquatic vegetation. We can also find fish like our seahorses that eat tiny crustaceans mollusks like our quahog clam that feed on tiny plants called phytoplankton. We can find ancient arthropods like our horseshoe crab. Horseshoe crabs are scavengers, so they'll eat algae, they'll eat dead fish, mollusks, so they're really opportunistic eaters. 
And they have this long tail in the back that kind of looks like a spike, but it's a tail. It's called a telson. And it's not used for poking. It is used so that if they're flipped over, they can right themselves so they are on the appropriate side. In estuaries, we can also find reptiles like our common snapping turtle, which has a very powerful scissor-like jaw. And snapping turtles are omnivorous eaters, so they will eat things like plants, fish, even birds and small mammals if they have the opportunity. They have very, very powerful jaws. So estuaries can also be really important habitats for migrating and breeding birds. So there are entire refugee areas uh, in estuaries that are protected so that we can help preserve these species. So in all of these different aquatic habitats, we find animals that have really unique adaptations. An adaptation is a change that helps these animals better survive and even thrive in these areas in and near the water. So one that I like to start with is what our dolphin and our duck have in common. These are very different creatures that live in different habitats. Our dolphin is a mammal and then our mallard duck is a bird. And one thing that they have in common is they both have the ability to sleep with half their brain on. And because they can sleep with half their brain still functioning, they're able to sleep with one eye open. And this allows them to be aware of their surroundings and to know if there's any danger. So for our mallard duck, danger might look like a fox or a raccoon. And for our spotted dolphin, danger might look like a killer whale. Being able to sleep with half their brain on is also a really important adaptation for the dolphin because it keeps them moving. They continue to swim while they're asleep and this helps them to regulate their body temperature and keep them warm in the cold ocean waters. It also reminds them to keep breathing. So although our spotted dolphins live in the water, they need to come up to the surface to breathe air with their lungs. So the ability to sleep with half their brain on helps them to do that. And oxygen is something that all of our aquatic animals need. So for something like our dolphin or even something as big as our right whale, they're going to be coming to the surface to breathe air with their lungs. But our whales have a cool adaptation that allows them to hold their breath for long periods of time. So some whales, like our sperm whale, can hold their breath up to 90 minutes. And they'll come up to the surface, expel any air in their lungs, and take a new breath using their blowhole. But holding your breath for 90 minutes might sound like a long time, but it's nothing compared to our sea turtle. Sea turtles also need to come to the surface to breathe air with their lungs, but they're able to hold their breath anywhere from four to seven hours if they're resting. So that's an extremely long time. Not every animal that spends time in the water has lungs. Some of our aquatic animals, like my brook trout here, use gills. This is a fish that uses gills to absorb oxygen right from the water. They don't have lungs at all. They absorb the oxygen through their gills. So the way that works is they will open their mouth, water will flow in through their mouth, over their gills, and back out. And the blood vessels in the gills will absorb the oxygen that they need. So that is how our fish get the oxygen. Sharks are also fish, so our sharks are going to use that adaptation as well. They're going to use their gills to absorb oxygen from the water. And sharks have a number of really cool adaptations, one of which is their skin. So shark skin have bony scales, dermal denticles right there that act as armor. They're very, very tough and they're very smooth on one side and rough on the other. And this helps them to have less friction when they're swimming through the ocean. 
Another cool thing about shark skin is they have specialized pores called ampullae that can pick up electric pulses through the water. So that's an entirely new sense that they can use to gather information about their surroundings. Sharks also have pretty cool teeth. Their teeth have adapted to fit the needs of their diet. So different sharks eat different foods. But sharks that are eating big prey, like turtles, mammals, uh, fish and giant squid, they're going to have really, really sharp, serrated, almost knife-like teeth. And sharks don't worry about losing a couple teeth while they're hunting because sharks have multiple rows of teeth. Unlike you and I that have our baby teeth and our adult teeth, sharks have an and almost an endless supply of teeth with row on row on row, ready to replace any tooth that falls out. Another cool thing about sharks is their skeleton. So unlike you or I that have skeletons made of bones, shark skeletons are made of cartilage. And you can feel cartilage in your own body by wiggling your nose or touching your ear, you can feel cartilage and how it's different from bone. It's lighter, it's more flexible, and again, is going to help them to swim faster. Another adaptation that sharks have, along with reptiles and seabirds, is a special gland to help with salt. So this is a herring gull, and a herring gull, like other seagulls, will take in a lot of salt water on a day-to-day -day basis but you can't have too much salt in your blood. So they have a special gland between their eyes that helps to get rid of any excess salt in their blood. And it is excreted through their nostrils. So if you ever see a seagull or a herring gull shaking their head or it looks like they're sneezing on the beach, they might just be getting rid of some excess salt. So just like sharks, whales have some adaptations to help them while they're eating. We have whales that survive on teeny tiny creatures called krill that are just about two inches big, and they are going to eat that krill using baleen. So the right whale behind me is a baleen whale, and we can see these layers of plates in their mouth that act as a filter. So right whales are skim feeders, and they will swim through a crowd of krill, letting it into their mouth, and through these comb plates called baleen, the water easily flows out while the krill are trapped inside. And because these whales are so big, they're eating lots and lots of krill per day, thousands of pounds. But not all whales eat krill. Some eat things like giant squid. So our sperm whale has a tooth that helps it to hunt. Very big, very sharp teeth that allow it to hunt things like giant squid. But one of the funnest teeth that I think whales can have is our narwhal that has a tooth that grows right out of its head and makes it look like a unicorn. Now, these tusks are not something that every narwhal has. Narwhals uh, that are male will have them, but only some females do. And scientists are still learning about what these tusks are used for. Some scientists believe that they're used to sense the area around them. Others think that they're used for communication. And some scientists believe that they're used to help them hunt. So there's still a lot to learn about narwhals, but I think it's a pretty cool tusk. And unlike our walruses, or elephants, they only grow one of these tusks through their head. Something that all of these whales have in common, along with a lot of other um, sea creatures, and especially marine mammals that are larger, like our walruses, seals, and whales, is a special layer of fat to protect them and keep them warm. This layer of fat is called blubber. It keeps their body heat in and protects them from their cold winter waters. Places like the Atlantic Ocean can get really, really cold, down below 30 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So this layer of fat is really important for them. And there's an easy science experiment that you can do at home to check that out. So if you have a couple of Ziploc bags, a bowl of ice water, a bin of, sh of shortening, and someone to help you, you can try this yourself at home. You fill your bag with the shortening and place a clean bag inside so that you can put your hand in without getting it dirty. And then you can place your hand in the cold ice water and your bare hand in next to it and feel the difference. That layer of fat is going to keep the heat in at a much better rate. So that's a cool experiment that you can try yourself at home. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. If you think of anything, just write it in the comment box below and I'll get back to you. And if you have a chance to visit one of these awesome aquatic habitats this summer, make sure you do your part in keeping it clean and protecting our waterways. Thanks for joining us. Have a good day.